cumulative effect and a derivative effect that's reaching the world even today. See, that one guy's miracle in the timing, because it was released into the lockbox of heaven, and Peter and John realized it was time. They went and did it. And boom. The miracle happened. The gospel's preached. 5,000 were saved. Then they got beaten and thrown in prison for it, which is part of the gospel. If you've got great fruit, you'll have great persecution. If you've got great grace on your life, you'll have great jealousy against you. That's why some of the most powerful ministers in the world get attacked by other Christians. Other people are jealous of them. They're like, well, why didn't that? Well, that can't be God. God's going to use anybody to use me. Me, myself, and I, the unholy trinity. We're the ones that he would use. <laughs> They should instead say, wow, I wonder why God's using that person. I wonder what they're doing different than me. You know, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing today as you did yesterday, but except expecting a different result, right? Yeah. Why don't we go find out what they're doing and why they're successful? And if the Lord says, I want you to do it too, let's learn from them. Instead of, well, they're not a, you know, they were casting out demons in your name, but they weren't from our group. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, we should call fire from heaven on them. Jesus said, you know now what manner of spirit you're of. Okay. Prayer has two sides praying to God and praying against the enemy. You don't have true authority to cast out the enemy until you've gotten your own life effectively right with God in prayer. Otherwise, you'll be like the seven sons of Siva who are out casting out demons saying, in the name of Jesus who Paul preaches, we command you to come out. Well, lower-level demons will come out. Because that's just how powerful the name of Jesus is. A non-believer can cast out a demon in the name of Jesus, the small ones, but if he runs into a big one, I know a story, true story. These guys were out casting out demons, and they'd heard this one guy, you know, had a demon in a certain house, so they figured they'd go by and evangelize and cast out the demon. God didn't send them. They weren't led by the Spirit. They were just using the name of Jesus, and it's got authority, and it was working. And they think, we're exorcists. Cool. They got a little full of themselves. True story. You can be sent by God, and you've got his protection. Or you can be one who went on your own, and you don't have his protection. If God didn't send you, he's not going with you. He's going to watch you until you come back. <laughs> and when you get to the end of yourself, now he'll begin again. This is what happened. True story. They knock on the door. The guy comes to the door. He's demonized. They're like, we're here to cast the demon out of you. He grabs the one and bites his nose off and spits it on the ground. True story. The other one freaks out. They're not casting out demons. Now they need medical. <laughs> <laughs> so be led by the spirit. It can be real dangerous if you're not led. Turn with me, if you will. Acts chapter 19, and this is going to be our keynote passage. Is this fun? Yeah. Acts chapter 19, we're going to look at three levels of spiritual warfare. Look to your neighbor say, three levels. Say with every new level. There's a new level of devil. New level, new devil. Some people never even know what's at the next level. They're so busy fighting that one. You know, some people, they don't fight the demons. They yield to them. You know, sometimes instead of casting the demon out of the person, you've got to cast the person out of the demon they like it so much. Man, come out of that demon. <laughs> okay. Jesus said in, in John 14, 31, he says, the prince of the world is coming, but he has nothing in me. Nothing in common. I'm of heaven, he's not. See, sometimes we don't get free from certain demons because we have too much in common with them. We're still in agreement with them. They meant ouch. You know, I, I asked one person, you want me to you know, cast that thing out of me? Eh, I don't know. Why would I bother? He's in agreement. See, we wouldn't be praying the prayer of agreement for him to be free. I'd be fighting him and the demon. They're in agreement. They've got the prayer of agreement going on for the demon to stay. No sense in playing around. Now, I can go intercede for the person that he'll have a desire to be free. 
Have you ever been? I don't really want to give that up. I got a spirit of gluttony or something. I just I don't like ice cream. I don't know. I like sugar. You know, I don't know if I want to give it up. Somebody, well, David, I'm going to pray for you. I'm like, I like the macadamia nut chocolate chip cookies. <laughs> You go ahead and plug in whatever your thing is. Do you want to be free? Whom the sun sets free is free indeed. Sometimes we don't want to be free. We like what we got. Okay. Acts chapter 19. Three levels of spiritual warfare. Here's what they are. Ground level warfare is casting out demons. Jesus cast out demons with his word. Yet we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. Wait a second. We cast out demons with the word, yet we wrestle with principalities and powers. They must be different. Amen? Amen. Matthew 8, 17. I think heal the sick, cast out demons with his word. Not sure if that verse is right. But we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. Spiritual wickedness in what? High places. Okay? I used to know some... Some high people in low places. <laughs> and, and, and they needed some demons cast out of them. But we were casting them into each other. You know? so, so the first level is ground level warfare, which is casting out demons. The second level is dealing with the occult. Israel Agra is over in Africa. He's dealing with occult practitioners. They put curses on people. So he's over there in Africa in these crusades casting demons out of people, but then he's also dealing with the next level up, new level, new devil, where he's not just dealing with demons and people, he's dealing with people that put curses and send demons out to attack him. See, it's one thing when you go to cast a demon out of a person, it's another thing when somebody sends demons to attack you. Right. Different level, isn't it? I've had people send evil spirits to attack me, and I've been asleep, and the Lord would wake me up. And as they would arrive, I would be ready and prepped. All of a sudden, you're just, you see it in a vision, you see it in a dream, you wake up, and it's like they show up and you rebuke them in the name of you. I've had people astral project when I was in prison. They astral projected into my prison cell. People that I would minister to on the compound, and they were into a thing called the art, or witchcraft, or Satanism, or whatever name it went by. Some sort of evil thing that they were involved in that was occultic, where they would lay in a pentagram, cut their foot, the blood would go into the mouth and the eyes of Lucifer, they'd have candles lit, a demon would come up out and come into their chest with a sulfur smell, and they would become empowered with a false spiritual gift. See, we get the Holy Spirit and gifts, they get their gifts from demons. Make sense? Yes. So they get false gifts. They get a familiar spirit. And sometimes a Christian will have the real gift in him, but he won't stay holy or she won't stay holy. So you want to know what happens? A familiar spirit comes alongside to help pray with them. And you get a mixture. That's why you got to be careful who you let lay hands on you. Make sure their life is right. Otherwise they could be imparting a little something to you. You didn't get the spiritual gift from the Lord, you got something you may need to cast out of you. But that's a whole nother message. We'll do that. Deal with that on a different day. Yeah. Amen? So when you allow somebody to pray for you, I went to go graduate with uh, my degree in theology. Spirit-filled, charismatic university. When the man went to ordain me, I had to talk with him beforehand. I said, listen, I said, with all due respect, I want you to pray that God gives me everything that he wants me to have and filter anything that he doesn't when you lay hands on me. I didn't mean to disrespect the guy, but I didn't want anything that wasn't from the Lord. And he, saw, he thought to himself, I wish, because scripture says, be hasty to lay hands on no man nor to share it his sins. And I wouldn't sit under somebody to lay hands on me. And this guy was an evangelist. And I, but you know what? Let's say he's got a stronghold in his life, and he lays hands on me, the good stuff comes with a couple of strongholds. All of a sudden, I got a problem that I didn't have before I had the hands laid on me, but I also got gifts from the Lord. I don't know why I'm on this subject. Goodness gracious. All right. Okay. 
ask the Lord to filter anything that comes through so you don't pick anything up. Many will come to me in that day and say, Lord, Lord, did we not cast out demons in your name and do many miracles in your name and prophesy in your name? Jesus never says the miracles weren't real, the prophecies weren't real. He says, away from a doer of lawlessness or, ni or iniquity, I never knew you. You were never intimate with me. See, it comes back to intimacy. Intimacy. Relationship. God's not so much concerned about your doctrine, that you're doctrinally accurate, as, as, as much as you're relationally accurate. He'll fix your doctrine. <coughs> If you work to get your relationship fixed. He can't fix your relationship if you don't want to. You can have perfect doctrine and no relationship. People graduate from cemetery, seminary school every day with no relationship. And they come in and preach a dead sermon. You know what the, the, the biggest <coughs> secret that's coming out in the body of Christ, the biggest scandal now? It's not adultery. It's not homosexuality. It's not drug use. It's not money mongering now. It's that some of the leaders in the Christian community are atheists. And they're so good at preaching a message now, they know the doctrine so well, but they go home, they don't even believe in God anymore. Billy Graham's associate in ministry died an atheist, and he started with him. Wow. Read The Case for Faith by Lee Strobel. You'll hear the story. It'll make you weep in the first chapter. How do you start that way and end that way? That's crazy, isn't it? So the biggest scandal that's about to come out in the body of Christ is ministers of sizable congregations that preach great messages are secretly atheists. But here's the interesting thing. They don't have a relationship with the Lord. All they are is a pulpiteer. They do it out of profession because it's their, their gift. They don't do it out of relationship. Now, let me ask you a question. If I was to go out on the streets and I was to connect with a woman, for intimacy, and it was her profession, what would we call her? Don't have to say it. <laughs> so if you only have intimacy with the Lord to get a message to give it to the people, what's that make you in God's eyes? Mm -hmm. Many will come to me in that day and say, Lord, Lord, did we not cast out demons in your name and do many miracles and prophesy in your name? I will tell them plainly, away from me, doer of iniquity, I never knew you. The word knew you is the same word that's used in Luke 134, where Mary said, how will this be that I will be with child? For I have never known a man. I've never been intimate with one. Same word. It's about intimacy. Into me, you see. When you're intimate with somebody, you have sight and vision into their life. There's some people you don't want to be intimate with. Not even in conversation. Some people, you just feel uncomfortable. You don't feel like you, they'll go, you share something with them, you'll be on the front page of the paper. I mean, you got telephone, telegraph, and you got tele Susie or something, you know? I mean, it's intimacy. So, the third level of spiritual warfare is the strategic level, which deals with principalities and territorial spirits. I'm going to read a passage here. Acts chapter 19, verse 11. Three levels of spiritual warfare. Level one, ground level, casting out demons. Level two, occult level, dealing with occult leaders and practitioners. And level three, strategic level, dealing with principalities and territorial spirits and spiritual wickedness in high places. And if you go in and try to cast out demons or deal with occult practitioners before you've dealt in intercession with those territorial spirits, you can get your clock clean. Acts chapter 19, verse 11. And God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul, so that from his body were brought unto the sick handkerchiefs or aprons, and the diseases departed from them, and the evil spirits went out of them. Was Paul a man bent on intercession on a regular basis? Absolutely. He interceded, pressed those things out. People's mindset started to change. That it was easy for him to send in handkerchiefs and aprons because it was out of intimacy that he did ministry, not out of profession, for money. Verse 13, Then certain of the vagabond Jews, exorcists, took upon them to call over them which had evil spirits the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, We adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preaches. And there were seven sons of Siva, a Jew, and chief of the priests, which did so also. Verse 15, And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know and Paul I know, but who are you? I actually had this happen to me one time. True story. I'm in Springfield, Medical Center for Federal Prisoners. I go up to pray for a guy. It's by the unction of the Spirit. True story. I'm on the, ho 
hospital floor, it's 3-2, it's the death ward. I go in, there's a guy that's got muscular dystrophy. He's in his chair, he's got his one little handle to move around. He's strapped in there, he's getting worse. And I go in and he's watching a minister on TV who's very anointed. They're having worship, the presence of God is there. There's a, a, a guard there, she's a lesbian, and she lets me up on this, the floor just to go talk to him for 10 minutes. Now, I'm going in there on divine assignment, because he's going to be healed, God sent me. I get there, worship's going on, he's in the right spirit, and I said to him, I said, you want to pray for healing? He's like, all right, let me unstrap you, because you're coming up out of this chair. I lay hands on him, and I say, in the name of Jesus, be healed, and all of a sudden I sense an evil spirit. Jesus Christ, I bind you and I command you to come out. His body began to vibrate under the power of God. And all of a sudden, it stopped vibrating and I saw his head go. And it wasn't him shaking it. I said, ooh. We're dealing with, and that's when I knew there was a spirit. I said, you foul demon, I command you to come out. And, and he'd been in witchcraft in uh, Cuba. He'd been given over to, to Satan as a young kid, and he had a generational curse on me. He went out and committed a couple murders and drug addiction, this and that. Anyway, so he was doing life, and, and he, was, he was dying. And he was born again, but hadn't been delivered of that component yet. And that's another issue of contention in the body of Christ. People say, oh, well, you know, can a Christian have a demon? I'm like, well, you know, can a Christian have a demon, or can the demon have the Christian? See, we aren't possessed as believers, but we're a trichotomous being, three parts, tri, spirit, it's who we are, we have a soul, we live in a body. When you get born again, your spirit gets born again, you become a third perfect overnight. Look at your neighbor say, you're a third perfect. <laughs> Isn't that neat? But there's two thirds that still needs to be worked on, the soul, mind, will, and emotions. We need to get it transformed through the renewing of the mind, through the washing of the water of the word, and then we need to present our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is our reasonable service. Our job to present our bodies, our job to get our mind renewed, God enables us, but we're the ones that read the word. Nobody forces you to do it, you do it, but he empowers you to do it. But our spirit, though the outward man perishes, the inward man is renewed day by day. So he does the inward renewing. You're a third perfect. The other two thirds needs work. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Where do you work it out from? Well, where's the salvation start? In your spirit. You've got to work it out into your soul and your body. That's why Peter's shadow healed the sick. He had some soul work done. He got it worked out and now all of a sudden the glory of God was filled. Make sense? A lot of, a lot of information here tonight. A lot of, yeah. People are like, hmm. You know, people don't do a lot of amen when they're masterful. <laughs> Get that? Okay. Verse 15, oh, well, let me tell you what the rest, rest happened. So I said, oh, in the name of Jesus, come out. And this happened three times. The third time, or the second time, he said, no. And I'm like, oh, I was angry. I said, oh, you're coming out of there in the name of Jesus. I got my voice strong now. The devils don't respond to how loud you talk. They respond to the authority. Uh, a 105-pound police officer, a woman, in New York City can stand in front of an 18-wheeler because she has a badge of authority. It's not her size. It's not how loud she yells. She... He's stopping because all of New York City is behind her. She knows her level of authority. She doesn't have to be mean or rude. She carries authority. And if you carry authority in the spirit, the demons are like, oh, yeah. oh no, not that one. Okay. But if you don't know your level of authority, you can't increase your level of authority by volume in your voice. They just know that now it's on like Donkey Kong because you don't know who you are. <laughs> so, so, so the third time I go to pray for him, power of God comes on him again, and this is what he says to me. The demon now has shaken the head the first time. The second time, no. The third time he said, Paul I know and Jesus I know, but who are you? I said, it's not who I am, it's whose I am. I serve Jesus Christ of Nazareth who came in the flesh. And in the authority of Jesus, I command you to come out of him right now. Body begins to shake again. It stops. And he shakes his head. He said, maybe later. Oh, later. I snap. You know, like, I can't believe this. Now I have a vision. While I'm praying, I have a vision of the lesbian guard 
coming down. He's coming down angry because now it's been like 15 minutes. I'm like five minutes beyond. And so I'm like, look, I got to go. I love you, bro. You know, this and that. You're okay. And he's crying. You know, he didn't get healed. Demons are speaking out of his mouth, you know. And, and I'm like, okay, this is not a good situation. I'm on the death ward, you know. And, and so, so I step out and I'm walking down the hall and she's coming like this, just like I saw in the vision. And I'm like, hey, how are you doing? She's like, I said, sorry, you know, fellowship. And, you know, I got off the floor, didn't go to the hole that day. Anyway, I'm like, Lord, you know, why couldn't you told me to go up there? Why couldn't I cast him out? And he said to me, this one cometh forth by nothing but prayer and fasting. Mark 9, 29, King James Anyway, you know, because some of the other versions, like, leave out the fasting part. You know, that dirty seven-letter word to most Christians. Yeah. Or dirty four-letter word, fast. We like, you know, walk a fourth meal of the day at Taco Bell. We got a Snickers hidden by the bed, you know. <laughs> in the morning, like, oh. I, I'll tell you how you know you need to fast. Is, is when you think about fasting, you're like, oh, I'm not doing that. That's when you need to fast. <laughs> right. When you can, like, go on a fast at the drop of a hat, you probably don't need to. But you can fast just by doing pushaways at the table. You don't even have to finish the rest of your food. You know, we eat way too much in America. I was at Golden Corral buffet down the street the other day with a friend. And, you know, I'm thinking to myself, I'm full, but they've got the chocolate fountain. <laughs> I sensed the Lord calling me to the chocolate fountain. But I was, I went. I wasn't sent. You know, there's liberty. There's liberty. Okay, so we've got... Ground level warfare casting out demons. Here's what happens. And the man in the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know and Paul I know, but who are you? Verse 16, and the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them and overcame them and prevailed against them so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. Why, why did he take their clothes off? He overcame them. He prevailed against them. They left naked and wounded. I wouldn't want to be on the receiving end of whatever it was. Amen or ouch. <laughs> verse 16, verse 17, and this was known to all the Jews and Greeks also dwelling in Ephesus, and fear fell on them, and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. Verse 18, and many that believed came and confessed and showed their deeds. Verse 19, many of them also, which used curious arts, brought their books together and burned them before all men. And they counted the price of them and found it 50,000 pieces of silver. So mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. First level was casting out demons. The next level was occult practitioners that had books of witchcraft that were worth 50,000 pieces of silver. What is silver? $30 an ounce right now? 50,000 times $30? It's a little bit of bank, isn't it? Notice they didn't sell them to the next person so that they could use the money for the kingdom of God. They burnt them. In Africa, after the witch doctors come, they bring their fetishes and their curious arts and their magical books that are worth big money, and they have a burning service. And when they burn, all kinds of weird colors come up. You can see spirits come out of the fire. Catch it on video. It's pretty interesting. But that's just stuff that happens when it's done the Word of God way. Now, let's look at the third level and the final level, which is, a cult, which is strategic level warfare. Verse 21, after these things were ended, Paul purposed in the spirit when he had passed through Macedonia and Achaia to go to Jerusalem, saying, after I've been there, I must also see Rome. Verse 22, so he went into Macedonia. He sent into Macedonia, two of them that ministered unto him, Timothy and Erastus, but he himself stayed in Asia for a season. He went back to prayer, didn't he? He sent them ahead, but he stayed in prayer, because you don't go until God tells you to go. Sometimes you have to pray for days, weeks, months, sometimes it's years before God will send you in, because you're interceding, pressing back the powers of darkness. You're wrestling against that stuff in the realm of the spirit, because demons you just cast out with the word but principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in high places and rulers of the darkness, you wrestle with them in intercession. Does this make sense? Seven types of prayer, three levels of warfare. See how the message ties together? Much prayer, much power. Little prayer, little power. No prayer, no power. That day I went in, Paul I know, and Jesus I know, but who are you? I had no power. I went back to prayer and fasting. Big revival broke out. Prayer groups all over the compound broke out. But you want to know what? The first day I went to pray, I went... 
Okay, God, I'm here on the back stairwell to pray. Here I am. I'm praying. I think I'll pray in time. Oh, I'm going to go to the next one. Okay, I'm praying. Finally, 15 miserable minutes in prayer. I was done. Kind of like you used to run five miles. Now you can't run five feet. <laughs> you're like on the treadmill. Going, <sighs> you're like a minute and 46 seconds. What happened? <laughs> what, where did I lose it at? I used to be such a superstar. I've got trophies and medals. and That was then. So you can't live on yesterday's prayer. His mercies are new every morning. So is our prayer life. Because prayerlessness is sinfulness. Far be it from me to sin against God and ceasing to pray for you. When we're prayerless, it's missing the mark, which then calls us to miss the mark in the natural. You remember when Jesus prayed, won't you tarry with me just one hour when he was... And the disciples kept falling asleep. I know you have never fallen asleep in prayer, but I will confess what I have. Here's the thing. Three times, this is going to hit some of you. Three times Jesus came back. Couldn't you tarry with me just one hour? They kept falling asleep, right? How many times did Peter deny Christ? How many hours did he miss in prayer? Three. See, prayer will strengthen you against temptation. And it will not be a temptation when it arrives. Do you know why boxers train for 15 rounds then knock somebody out in a minute and 48 seconds first round? Because they train for 15 rounds. That's why they could knock them out in a minute 48 seconds. When they don't train beyond the first round, they can hardly make it to 15, or they get knocked out. If you train in prayer, you'll knock the enemy out like that. But don't ever think because you knock him out that easily that you don't need to pray as if you were going 15 rounds with him. Much prayer, much power, little prayer, little power, no prayer. How much power do you have? I can tell you by how much prayer you've got. And I can tell by how I see you in the natural operating in the power, how much time you've spent in prayer. Or if you've got holes in your armor. Verse 23. And the same time there arose no small stir about that way, talking about the Christians, what they were teaching Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life. In verse 24, for a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith, which made silver shrines for Diana. Brought no small gain unto the craftsmen. Who's Diana? Verse 25. Whom he called together with the workmen of like occupation, the silversmith group, and said, Sirs, you know that by this craft we have our wealth. Not that we make our living, we've got our wealth. They're making big money. What are they making it off of? Moreover, you see and hear that not alone at Ephesus, but almost throughout all Asia, this Paul... Those that have turned the world upside down have come here too. Those apostles are here. What are they doing in our town? We need to get rid of them. Crucify him! How do we get rid of Jesus? He's messing up the Sanhedrin Council of the Seventy. <laughs> well, what can we do? Well, we can bear false witness against him. Maybe we can get one of his disciples to sell him out for 30 pieces of silver. I mean, God forbid we should read the Old Testament prophecies and confess that he's the Christ. We don't want to lose our position in the synagogue. Now we've got Paul, who's messing things up for us over here, and it could mess up our wealth because we make these silver idols under Diana. Paul has persuaded and turned away much people, saying that they be no gods which are made with our hands. Verse 27, so that not only this, our craft is in danger. It's always an economic thing. You ever notice that? When people start to attack your economics, you get angry, don't you? Well, they're the same way about yours. So that not only by this craft, our danger, our craft is in danger to be set at nothing, but also that the temple of the great goddess Diana should be despised and her magnificence should be destroyed, whom all Asia and all the world worship. They were worshiping a principality because scripture says behind every idol there's a demon. Your football team you're not careful. You can become an idol. God bless your football team and your basketball team. Praise God for them. But if you have more focus on them than you do in your prayer time with God, there's a problem. 
But if you spend time in prayer, they'll win. Okay. <laughs> Verse 28. And when they heard these sayings, you got to pray for the chiefs a lot. And when they heard these sayings, there was a lot of prayer last year. They were full of wrath, anger, and cried out, saying, Great is Diana of the Ephesians, and the whole city was filled with confusion. See, God is not the author of confusion. The enemy is. How did the whole city be filled with confusion? There was a principality, strategic level warfare, that Paul had tapped into. He'd stirred that thing up, and it had warfare back. It stirred up the whole city. And this is what they said. And the whole city was filled with confusion, and having caught Gaius and Aristides, Aristarchus. Well, some of these names in the Bible are amazing. Quiet. Aristarchus, how are you? <laughs> Men of Macedonia. Macedonia. Of course, we got all kinds of crazy names, too. They read our stuff, they'd be like, those are some weird Christians. Okay. <laughs> Paul's companions in travel, they rushed with one accord into the theater, and when Paul would have entered into the tent, in under the people, the disciples said, don't do it. Verse 31, and certain of the chief of Asia, which were his friends, sent unto him, desiring that he would not adventure himself into the theater. Some therefore cried one to another, one thing and some another, for the assembly was confused. They didn't even know why they were there, what they were upset about. You ever go to a situation where people don't even know why they're there? Just a crowd grew and they're like caught up in the moment? Crowds in power. Great book, by the way. Verse 32, some therefore cried one thing and another another, and... For the assembly was confused, and the more 